Good afternoon. My name is Karen Taylor, and I'm the founder and director of Why We Are Still Here. Our mission is to and educate, enshrine, and preserve the extraordinary legacy of Harlem as an influential incubator that was vital to the intellectual, cultural, social, and political advancements of the Harlem community, as well as the African diaspora. Our vision is to ensure that the post-gentrification community of Harlem and beyond will honor and find a meaningful connection to the legacy of African-American achievement and its paramount importance to world culture. I welcome you to the first discussion in a two-part discussion series, um, Decades of Resistance in Harlem from New Negro Militancy to the Young Lords. Today we're presenting uh, author Jeffrey Perry, interviewed by Essie Anderson. And Jeffrey Perry is the author of Hubert Harrison, The Struggle for Equality, 1918 through 1927. He's an independent working class scholar, formally educated at Princeton, Harvard, Rutgers, and Columbia. His work focuses on the role of white supremacy as a retardant to progressive social change. Essie Anderson has taught mathematics, science, and black history at Queens College, Sarah Lawrence College, SUNY at Old Westbury, Rutgers University, the New School University, City College, and Queens College. He was one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party, as well as an activist within the Student Nonviolent Commit Coordinating Committee and the Black Arts Movement of the 1960s. I welcome you both. Thanks, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Sister Karen. Um, this is um, uh, going to be a very interesting discussion, and, and obviously, we will not have enough time for <laughs> to, to 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 cover um, this. Not only the uh, uh, Jeff Perry's work, but Hubert Harrison himself. Um, Jeff Perry's second uh, volume on Hubert Harrison is the one we're focusing on, uh, Hubert Harrison, The Struggle for Equality, uh, 1918 to 1927. For those who uh, may feel uh, slightly intimidated by books, this book is about a thousand pages. It is, it is uh, a major work on a major uh, black figure of, of Harlem. And, um, uh, before we get into it, I'd just like to get from Jeff uh, a little bit of history of who he is and, and also why he decided to write uh, these, uh, these two volumes on Hubert Harrison. <clears throat> By the way, 99.9% .9 of the people in Harlem do not even know, not in Harlem and the world, do not even know who, who Hubert Harrison is uh, and, and the impact he made. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I was born in the Bronx. My, my family's all working people as far back as we can uh, trace. Uh, no one went to college. I don't know that anyone ever finished uh, high school. Um, uh, in 1955, we moved out on a GI Bill to Paramus, New Jersey, outside New York. It's one of those communities that sprang up from 55 to 64 on the GI Bill. GI Bill, the statistics on that were uh, you could get a house, first off, you could get a house with zero down payment, low interest loan. And uh, the statistics were of the 70,000 GI loans awarded, less than 100 went to families of color. That's how you get the lily white suburbs around all of New York and other cities. I didn't know any of this, of course, when I was growing up. I just went to the playground and played ball, basketball, baseball. <laughs> that's what I knew. Um, and, uh, but that's what I knew growing up at first. And I, um, I played sports. We had very nice teams. We went to state and county championships in, in the major sports that I played. And I was able to go to college and I went to college. I went to Princeton, which was, you know, uh, I didn't even know what was going on, but I went there, you know, and, um, uh, after I finished, I had to face the draft. I was a, an opponent of the Vietnam War. I resisted the draft. Um, I, 
I went to graduate school at Harvard, right? And uh, I was there for a few months, but then I got disenchanted with what was going on because they weren't really addressing, I thought, the social problems. I was in a school of education and they weren't really addressing the social problems in terms of um, public education in the country. Uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, I traveled down to Cuba. You know, I, I hitchhiked with $300 and going for a dollar a day, third class buses and trains down to Argentina and back. I wanted to try and just figure things out for myself, not the normal route that people take. Um, and when I came back, um, I started doing some work in, in South Jersey for a while. I know, Sam, you had some Black Panther Party experience. I, for a few months, volunteered at a chapter down there in Jersey. So I started to learn a little more. Um, and then I... Um, uh, when I came up after I did the Cuba thing, I worked at the Guardian, which was an independent radical news weekly that came out for a while. I worked there and uh, I worked also. Um, I was uh, I started getting active shortly after I came back from Cuba in the Puerto Rican Socialist Party. I know you're discussing Puerto Rican movement uh, next time. And I was active for three or four years and a very worthwhile experience, wonderful comradeship, people I'm still in touch with. But after about three or four years, I, I came to the conclusion, I really have to concentrate on work uh, in the workplace, trying to combat white supremacy amongst European Americans. I thought that was a particular responsibility of mine. And that was partly because I was influenced by a fellow named Theodore W. Allen. And if people are not familiar with him, uh, he's very important because he pioneered a class struggle-based white skin privilege analysis in 1965. That's decades before all this other stuff came out. And in 1990s, he um, published two volumes, major volumes of major importance entitled The Invention of the White Race. And it goes back to 17th century Virginia and how this whole thing started in this country. And I, I've subsequently, I've um, edited new versions for Verso books of that. So in brief, that's uh, some of my political background. And then, oh, one last thing. So when I'm working in the post office, at one point, I started, uh, I was doing pro, uh, work in a community-based program in Newark. It was helping pay my tuition, where the aim of the program was to help get Black and Latino workers into the construction trades, right? And I was you know, taking part, and that was Muriel Tillinghast. You may know another SNCC worker from way back, and still a long-time friend of mine. And uh, I was doing that, and uh, I, I started doing graduate work. And... Uh, I started addressing the problem pretty soon along the way, why no socialism in the US? And I focused on the question of white supremacy and I'm a very rigorous researcher. And I started from the turn of the 20th century and I poured through all the texts, the documents, the publications. I have a collection, you can't see it right here now, but I have about 7,500 books and uh, 750 boxes of material. And this is after I placed over 100 boxes of Hubert Harrison's papers at Columbia, over 100 boxes of Allen's papers at UMass Amherst alongside Du Bois's papers, and another 100 papers of my own labor stuff up at UMass Amherst so far. But we've got a lot more coming. So I'm a serious researcher. And what happened very simply is I'm writing on why no socialism and I see some passing references to Hubert Harrison, as you said, said Sam. He wasn't well known by many people. And uh, the references were in J.A. Rogers' World's Great Men of Color, a uh, piece by Richard B. Moore in, uh, in the Encyclopedia of the uh, uh, American Negro, whatever the title was back then, you know, and um, a piece by Philip Foner. And uh, I said, who is this guy? So I went up to the Schomburg Center. And uh, I read two books that Harrison had written, The Negro and the Nation in 1917, and When Africa Awakes, The Inside Story of the Stirrings and Strivings of the New Negro in the Western World. And that was written in 1920. And when I say read them, I, uh, they were on microfiche, I believe, or microfilm. And I had to print them out, take them home and read them. Uh, but when I read them, 
I, I, I stopped right in my tracks. I said, this is the clearest thinking activist in that early 20th century that I had come across on the essential questions, you know, on the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy. And he also understood, which really struck a note with me, that it was not in the European American workers' interest to be white supremacist, which was highly unusual. A lot of people take it as a given, this, that, and the other. So I set out to write on Hubert Harrison. And I was at Columbia working under two excellent scholars, Nathan Huggins, who was at Columbia and then went up to Harvard at the Du Bois Institute, but unfortunately died uh, within a year or two after that. And Hollis Lynch, um, who's from Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, One of his daughters is still at at the Schomburg and filmmakers, you know, they're a a very important family. And, um, they were my advisors, and I started writing on Harrison. And then what happens, back then, you could type a letter and switch who it was going to, you know, change, change the email uh, or the uh, the address and send it all over. So I did that, and I got a response from a librarian in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands who says, oh, I'm related to Hubert Harrison's family, and his son and daughter are alive. And she gave me their addresses. So his daughter, Ada, was alive up in Yonkers. And his son, William, was on 150th Street off Bradhurst, right? So I arranged to have a meeting with them both. And they, of course, wanted to know what did I want to write about their dad for. I understood that. And on the second meeting, I brought them three chapters I had done. And then on a third meeting, I was a bit surprised. They took me into the front room of a cold water flat, you know, straight, you know, one of those railroad flats kind of, this, uh, railroad this, flats. Uh, th- this was uh, the beginnings Nin- of the first volume. Yeah, 1980 or 81. And right. um, okay. and they uh, said, here, take these papers and do with them what you need to do with them. And I was overwhelmed that they trusted me. They had such confidence. I took them home. I became an archivist. You know, I preserved them, documented them, transcribed them. All this while working full time, because I'm a full time activist in the post office and then later as an officer in the postal union and editor at the branch, local and national level at various times. And um, so but I I was steady every day, every day. And uh, and then when I finished my dissertation, they eventually told me, "Okay, that's enough, Jeff. I had done 812 pages, which was essentially my volume one. It went up to 1917. And then I took, um, I, I'm about ready to end this little segment. I took Harrison's daughter, Ada, out to B. Smith's restaurant, which was a little bit of a splurge for me. <laughs> I, right. I usually don't have much money. And uh, we sat down and at the end of the meal, she uh, reaches into her bag and she goes, here, Jeff, here's one more thing for you. And she gives me Hubert Harrison's diary. I mm. had no idea it existed. I had already written, you know, 800 pages, volume one. And so I knew I had two volumes. And then from that point, 1987 till 2005, my task was to complete the second volume, but also to get them both published because uh, the publisher who wanted to publish my book was just couldn't believe who's who's Hubert Harrison, who's Jeff Perry. Are you kidding me? You know, right. and I went through it, even though all the rev- reviews by the outside readers were excellent. So we went through that. And um, but ultimately, Columbia University said yes, they wanted to do it. And they had a very progressive editor, senior editor at that time. Mm-hmm. So that's some of the background. Mm-hmm. Okay, great, great. Um, there's so much There's so much to cover um, in Hubert Harrison's life. Uh, so many people intersecting in his life in, in, in the Harlem community. Um, uh, I, I, I think I might want to just start with um, the connection between Hubert Harrison and Arturo Schomburg. You know, and, you know yeah. describe that. And, and because the, the fascinating thing is that Arturo Schomburg also is linked to Jose Marti yes. in terms of Jose Marti coming to New York and actually learning how to do organizing from black Cubans who were in the cigar f- factories in New York City. And, 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 and they were 
they were they were close these they were close comrades with 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 Schomburg, um and, and and lived in um a, a section of of Greenwich Village that that was a, a, a primarily black section it was just, just a fascinating links with these 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 networking and uh, just talk about the link between Hubert Harrison and Arturo Schomburg. fine uh, Harrison and Schomburg um start uh they start working together and interacting in some lyceums that were set up on 53rd street in manhattan saint benedict the moore church and saint mark's ame church this is before the irt was completed to um harlem in 1904 um the lyceums were established and you'd have African-Americans and Afro-Caribbeans coming together and they'd have lecturers or speakers, you know, once a month. And Harrison called it the germ of black racial consciousness in New York because they had wonderful discussions, freewheeling discussions. People spoke their mind, but they could be friends afterwards, right? They, you know, it's a healthy intellectual atmosphere. And Schomburg was involved in that. Johnny Bruce, one of the leading black journalists of the time, a woman named Williana Jones at that time is uh, she's a New York school teacher. Later, Williana Jones Burroughs, Charles Burroughs, who's one of Harrison's friends and a postal worker along with Harrison. And um, so that's the, some of the early contact. Then uh, before I leave that, I just want to mention when Harrison's working in the post office with Charles Burroughs and others from 1907 to 1911, they would get together. And it's really resonated with me because we used to do the same thing 70, 80 years later. After the midnight shift, we'd get off and we'd go to somebody's house and have a study group. And Harrison and Burroughs and people did that. But what they did, amongst other things, is they con uh, corresponded with the Bla uh, uh, Black Independence Party in Cuba. You know, there was correspondence with them. And that's discussed in volume one. But moving on. Um, so Harrison has that interaction with Schomburg. He later works with Schomburg and Bruce in the uh, Negro Society for Historical Research around 1911. He's one of the founders and one of the officers. And they stay in close, you know, in close touch and they're friends. Uh, Schomburg winds up delivering the eulogy at Harrison's funeral. And it's very laudatory. Um, and one other thing, in 1924, Harrison and Schomburg are two of the officers on the founding com committee. It was a, a committee on Negro literature and prints or Negro prints and literature of the 135th Street Library, which grows into the Schomburg Center, right? And there were some other people involved. And Harrison in all that period was speaking at the public library, encouraging people to come. He considered free public libraries, one of the great institutions in the country. And, um, you know, he, he really helped build that library at 135th Street in many, many ways. And even after he died, Augusta Savage did a portrait of him, which was supposed to hang in the lobby of the library. And it did for a while, but it, it's not been found in recent years, you know. So, so you should explain uh, also who Augusta Sh Savage is. Augusta, of, Sav you know. <laughs> uh, Augusta Savage is from Florida, and she's uh, an outstanding sculptress, sculptor, um, uh, one of the best in the world in the mid-20s, 24, 25, 26. And uh, she's a friend of Harrison's, but she wins scholarships to, to some of the top uh, study places in Europe. But she can't right. go either because she doesn't have the money or because once they find out she's of African descent, there's difficulties imposed. Harrison tries to um, help raise funds for her and they stay very close, you know, as, as friends and everything like that. And uh, people want to know about her. And there's some in Harrison's papers. There's some material on Har There's material on Schomburg. There's material on Savage. Um, yeah, go on. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Also. Um the African Blood Brotherhood connection okay. uh, and linking that evolution of the African Blood Brotherhood in, in, within the Garvey movement uh, and the tensions that existed between the quote unquote um, communist uh, folk and um, uh, uh, Hubert Harrison, right? You know, that, that, that dynamic 
because that was uh, to me that that was a a, a a pivotal moment. There were so many pivotal moments in that period, but that was a pivotal moment for me in terms of the evolution of uh, black uh, independent uh, radical thinking and and organizing. Okay, well, th that gets a little involved, as you know. And um, Harrison uh, founds the first organization and the first newspaper of the Militant New Negro Movement in 1917, They're The Voice and uh, the Liberty League. 1917. Huh? 1917. 1917, before Briggs founds the Crusader. Uh, and um, they're race conscious. They demand enforcement, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. They're opposed to uh, lynching. You know, very militant, preach arms, self-defense, you know, and and in volume one, I have a list of the important Harlem radicals who are working in or around Harrison's uh, organization, many of whom then go into Garvey's movement later on. Um, and uh, Harrison's work precedes that of the messenger of Chandler Owen and A. Philip Randolph, of the crusader of Cyril Briggs and of the Negro world of Marcus Garvey. And Harrison is a major influence on all of them. And they're, they're, that's acknowledged by the contemporaries. And, um, but what happens is um, regarding the African blood brotherhood. Uh, and I, I personally think there's a lot more research has to be done into that because, um, you know, sometimes people just go, just straight off the top with some wild numbers of the size and membership and things like that, because I've, I've not really come across that in my serious research. I mean, I've seen the comments and uh, people may or may not know, but Cyril Briggs had a serious speech impediment. So he, he was never a public speaker. And, and back in the day, the two main ways of reaching the masses were publications and public speaking. Um, but uh, the Crusader was Briggs's paper, and his organization was the African Blood Brotherhood, and it attracted some other very outstanding activists. And um, they, uh, there was an effort to try and bring them together with Harrison uh, around 1920, uh, and I discussed this in volume two. Uh, and uh, Rose Pastor Stokes was a communist, uh, and reportedly she offered money to Harrison to come and uh, you know take the lead in this effort, but he declined. And the comment by one of the participants was, "Harrison didn't want to be anyone's stalking horse against Garvey." Right? Um, Harrison Harrison was working with Garvey. He had criticisms of Garvey, which very soon developed into serious criticisms. But um, he was wary of the uh, because he had come through the Socialist Party. Harrison had been the leading black activist in the Socialist Party, and he poured out heart and soul. He spoke as many as 23 times a week. He wrote the first early major theoretical pieces in 1911 and 1912 in Socialist publications. He went down in front of Wall Street in 1911, uh, 1912, excuse me, and spoke for three hours on socialism at the corner of Broad and Wall in what I, uh, with a smile on my face, refer, as, refer to as the first Occupy Wall Street. He had a, uh, right. the audience went as far as the audience could reach. And, um, uh, but he concluded, and I cite all his reasons, uh, that the Socialist Party put the white race first before class. That they they weren't, and it was primarily in terms of African Americans, but he also cited their treatment of Asian Americans and their position on Asian Americans. Harrison was a ex extraordinary internationalist. It's important to know also. So Harrison had left the Socialist Party, and then uh, Owen and Randolph picked up with the Socialist Party. Briggs was working somewhat independently and then gets picked up by the Communist Party. Now, one thing, Sam, that I, th I find very interesting, because it has relevance today, even back then, it's important to follow the money and see where the financing of all these organizations is coming from. Um, and uh, Harrison it reportedly, with his Liberty League, and this is reported in a couple of places, turned down $10,000 from a white supporter in 1917 for his organization because 
he he says uh, if they if they're paying that bill, they're going to want to you know dictate my policy, and, I, and he's not going to so do it. For um, do you know what ten thousand dollars equals in today's <laughs> money? <laughs> wow, wow, like, millions, like, I think. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like millions. a million. Dollars. <laughs> and, and, but, and, and that so was a brief, lot of money. A yeah. Lot of money. So br briefly, uh, Owen and Randolph were getting money from the socialists. Briggs was getting money from the communists. And both those groups, after a number of years, got money from something called the Garland Fund, which was um, a, a charity that was set up to finance certain causes. And Du Bois also got money from the Garland Fund. And uh, Garvey got money by his financial um, projects, schemes, whatever they were, you know, a lot of things that people didn't get their money back on, whether it's the Black Star Line, Liberian Construction Loan, all those things. A lot of money came in. People didn't get reimbursed. Um, but so what happens is there's this effort to bring Harrison together with the um, with Briggs. They don't quite it doesn't quite work out. They have uh, Briggs is also working with the Emancipator in 1920, and there's a debate between the Emancipator and Harrison, and they go back and forth. Briggs is kind of low key on that; it's mostly Randolph and Owen. Um, right. Yeah, but it, and it gets pointed at some points, you know. And uh, I think it has some ramifications for why Owen later on turns away from socialism. I don't know if you caught that in there, but and because um, Harrison could be very pointed with his you know, comments and criticisms. Uh, but one thing, as I'm coming to understand more and more, in the period around 1920, 21, particularly after the 1919 insurrections in the cities, Washington, Chicago, and elsewhere in the country, to fight back, you know, against racism. Right, the, uh, the Red Summer. Right. In, in response to that, the U.S. government was trying to attribute much, and this is because J. Edgar Hoover was already playing a leadership role in the Bureau. It was the Bureau of Investigation at that time. Right. And they were trying to blame it on the black radical socialists. You know, previously it had been the anarchy. You know, they always had somebody to blame it on. Right. And Harrison took issue with that. He said, no. I mean, and he thought the socialists like to hear that and the black socialists like to hear that. He goes, no. But the response coming from the community is because of the white supremacy they're facing and the overall oppression. And uh, he, he wanted to keep stressing that. So he he differed with Briggs and uh, on those issues and more. Later on, Briggs said some very nice things about Harrison, um, but uh, they didn't really work together very much. And later on in 26, Harrison was asked to head uh, the American Negro Labor uh, Committee, I guess it was, which was a CP organization. Um, but uh, that's some of what you're hinting yeah. at, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. And, and, and the other thing that we should remember in this period were the informants. Yes. <laughs> And, and one thing very important about that is Harrison from the Liberty Congress in 1918, where he and William Monroe Trotter uh, organized a major black protest effort during World War I. Men and women from 35 states go to D.C. to protest Woodrow Wilson's war to make the world safe for democracy. Harrison had founded his Liberty League under the slogan, Make the South Safe for Democracy. You know, and he did that on 132nd Street when he had the founding meeting and um, the Liberty League. Uh, so they had protested on that. And uh, and then it gets involved because Spingarn tries to block it. Du Bois tries to, uh, you know, intervene. He writes an editorial. That's the one that Du Bois is most embarrassed about for the remainder of his life. It's called Close Ranks. And he says, while this war lasts, let us forget our special grievances and close ranks. And Harrison takes him to task for that. So there was uh, those issues that were in the background. And um, so Harrison was a, a, an outspoken critic of many people along the way. And I'm sorry, right. your, your question leading into this, uh, forgive me. <laughs> uh, about the informants. Oh, yeah. The, so you know, at the Liberty Congress uh, that Harrison and... Um, try to uh, were co-conveners of it began at that Harrison became one of the very first black radical activists to be monitored uh, by 
uh, the Bureau of Investigation and by military intelligence, which was the British kind of equivalent, the military intelligence of uh, Great Britain. And from 1918 Liberty Congress, even when he comes back to New York and when he goes elsewhere, they're keeping tracks and records on him most of which I have behind me in these boxes. I was able to get them after a number of years. Um, and it's not only Harrison. I've got the uh, files on Briggs, on Richard B. Moore. I, one thing I want to say about Richard B. Moore, Richard B. Moore is a, a, a great a proponent of Harrison, but he works very closely with Briggs also. He's in the African Blood Brotherhood. He's in the Socialist Party. He's a leading orator for the Scottsboro Boys and a number of other things. His daughter, Joyce Moore Turner, is still alive. She's 100 years old. In August of last year, she had an article published in a peer-reviewed journal of Caribbean history on uh, Ethelred Brown, who's a fellow who sets up the Hubert Harrison Memorial Church um, right. after Harrison dies. Um, but I mean, so the, a number of people involved in this stuff. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, my short-term memory set. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the other fact that in terms of are we getting feedback? Oh, okay. Um, is Harrison's relationship to the radical women that were uh, involved in the various movements in, <coughs> excuse me, in, in, in Harlem and elsewhere. You know, um, you, you had mentioned a couple already. Um, <laughs> Can you uh, uh, yes. talk about I'll, that? that? Yes, I'll, I'll mention yes. some. Uh, Williana Jones Burroughs, um, and by the way, Williana Jones Burroughs and Charles Burroughs, their son and his wife founded DuSable Museum in Chicago, Museum of African American right. History. Uh, mm -hmm. So very important activists. Harrison, as I mentioned, Augusta Savage. Uh, Harrison has, um, he works with Marcus Garvey's first wife, Amy uh, Ashwood Garvey, um, on a, a book, The Rise and Fall of, Mar on a manuscript, The Rise and Fall of Ma Marcus Garvey. And he works with her on that. He works with um, uh, a number of people, Virgin Island activists. Um, Elizabeth Hendrickson is a woman named Sylvani Smith. And I know her name in particular because her daughter's alive and well in Harlem, and she contacted mm -hmm. me on that. And um, uh, let me think. Uh, so he, he's active with some of, uh, some of the women, you know. Uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Some more did, will come back. Did, um, he he sees did, Ida Wells Barnett when he goes to Chicago. You know, he, right. he interacts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think of uh, was was it too early? For him to meet with meet up with Claudia Jones. Yes, it was too early. Yeah, she comes later, I believe. She yeah. comes later in the in yeah. the thirties. Yeah. Right. But but um, I just did an interview a week or two uh, with Carol Boyce Davies. You know, for her and her class, and she writes yeah, about. She's a good friend. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Um, the other other issue um, in, in terms of um, Hubert Harrison. Did he ever work for the New York Times? No, he did not work for the New York Times, but he wrote starting in 1903. When Harrison comes to New York in 1900, he's still in high school because he comes, he's working at night, and he mm -hmm. starts publishing letters to the editor of the New York Times. And between 1903 and 1910, he has 14 letters published. It's kind of remarkable, including two front page uh, pieces on the New York Times. It, it, it's now the Sunday review of books. It used to be the Saturday review of books. So he's writing for them then. And then in the 20s, he writes more, mostly book reviews and pieces like that. Um, but he writes for a wide array of publications. I, I just want Harrison, besides being an outstanding radical, you know, in, involvement with all these groups, with the New Negro Movement, uh, he, he, he becomes the editor of Garvey's Negro World. Um, he uh, writes uh, for a host of publications. In Garvey's Negro World, he starts the Poetry for the People section. He starts the Book Review section. He describes himself as the first regular 
book reviewer in Negro newspaperdom. You know, he's writing regular book reviews. He's a lecturer, and this I think you will appreciate, and others of the, of the listeners perhaps. He's a lecturer for the New York City Board of Education for five years. The only black speaker, I think, I think the first for five yeah. years, delivering evening lectures oftentimes at the library on 135th Street or elsewhere. And it's on literary trends of the time, but it's also on African history, international affairs, things like that. And the, the, we, lecture, huh? the, lecture, the lecture was for primarily geared for adults, right? Yes. And well, and it was a form of adult education for many of the right. working people. And you'll also see uh, on the cover of the second volume is a course that Harrison was teaching on world problems of race. And in that, oh, there's somebody else there I want to mention too, on world problems of race. Uh, and Harrison's got a group of 70 plus people there. And Richard B. Moore's in the picture, W.A. Domingo. Um, and also in the back is Hermie Weisswood, who's, right. uh, she and her husband. Do you, have a slide? Do you have a slide for that? So that people who have not seen the book can, can, can see the, the slide. Um, do I have a slide? How do I get it to you? Um, I, I'll show you. The, here's the picture. Well, you, you said you had seven slides that you wanted to show. Oh, yeah, that wasn't one of the ones. I just did the oh, cover. Okay. okay. It. It's That's right. the cover. But um, And it's it's a wonderful photo. And uh, yes. as a matter of fact, I hope, it's my hope that some of the people in the Harlem community might be able to step forward and identify a relative, you know, a grandparent or something like that. We'll, we'll learn more. And uh, Sam, if I may, one of the things, the reason I wrote these books, uh, aside from everything else, I became convinced of Harrison's importance uh, for current and future generations. But I describe in the introduction to volume two why I wrote it and why I wrote it the way I did with all of this, because um, I wanted to put the material before current and future generations, so Harrison will no longer be ignored. His right. material is there, it's available. If you're interested in poetry, you're interested in literature, public speaking, political activism, pick a topic. He's rich in what he has to offer. And also what's very unique about this second volume, <laughs> heavy as it is, is in the footnote, end notes, excuse me, in the end notes, wherever possible, I have links to what he's talking about online, so whether it's his article, because Columbia, part of the agreement when we placed Harrison's papers at Columbia was they would digitize much of Harrison's collection and 1300 plus items are available for free online at Columbia, uh, the Hubert H. Harrison papers digital collection at Columbia University. And so there's links to them, but not only Harrison's writings, links if he's reviewing a book we put links to them because harrison i've identified over 70 book reviews he did he's a brilliant book reviewer you know yeah um um hubert harrison uh education background is is what <laughs> this brilliant man right yes his education background is what it's an inspiration for everybody <laughs> he, he's born in saint croix in the virgin islands his mother is a Barbadian immigrant plantation worker, and his father was a born enslaved Crucian plantation worker, and he's born in 1883. And he lives on a state Concordia near the Salt River. There's two estate Concordias. He lives there for a while, and then he moves to the water gut section of Christianstead. That's that's where the water flows. You know, It's the poorest section of Christianstead, so to speak. And he's living there until 1900. His mom dies in 1899. And then he comes to New York in 1900, following the path laid by his older sister. And I want to point out that this is a, uh, what I found to be common oftentimes in Afro-Caribbeans uh, you know, coming to New York, that the, the female would pave the way for others in the family. And that was the case with Harrison. And Harrison comes to New York at first, He's living on West 63rd because I, uh, West 62nd, because as I mentioned, um, the IRT hadn't been completed yet. And uh, uh, 20 years so later, West, West 63rd. West 62nd was Hell's Kitchen. 
Yes. West 63rd, I believe, is with Thelonious Monk, grows up 20 years later right. or something like that, right. too. And um, I have a picture of that in volume one, the, the apartment. He, well, No, I have a picture of the apartment uh, on the next block to where he lived because it was these were my this was an improvement because they had the inner courtyard, if you will. You know, you could get some fresh air. Um, right. But so and Harrison starts working full time a couple nights and he goes to high school at night. And within a year or two, because he had only gone up to about eighth or ninth grade in St. Croix. But in St. Croix, he had opportunities still that were not afforded by many of the African-American population in the U.S., particularly down south. He um, he had a chance to study under the best or was reported to be the best teacher, black or white, in St. Croix, a fellow named Wilford Jackson, father of D. Hamilton Jackson, a major figure in Crucian history. And um, he... Uh, he also had access to a church um, in Christiansted where the minister let him go in and use the books in the church library. So he would read voraciously, even then when he was young. He comes to New York. He goes to high school um, at night. And it's a headline in the New York, uh, New, York Sun, New York World, New York Sun, I can't remember, one of the dailies. And it says, genius found in West Indian pupil. They hadn't seen anybody like this. He gets citywide yeah. honors in a couple of areas. And um, so that, that gave a little indication, but then he continues. He never has the opportunity to go to college. He has no funds, no family. He's always got to work. Um, and that might have been a good thing. Huh? And that might have been a good thing. Yeah, yeah no, he, he maintained his independence. And I have some comments in there on Harrison is an autodidact, as is the other fellow I write about, Theodore W. Allen. And I've got some right. comments someplace where sometimes the autodidact sees things much more clearly than those in the academy. You know, their mind doesn't get <laughs> all right. confused by what's going on there. And so he, he had some very much clarity of thought. And so he's always, always self-educating and um, reading and writing. It was said when he died. Uh, now, I, I take some of this stuff with a grain of salt. It was said that he read as many as six books a day. I don't think he read entirely because I've been through his books. But I saw where he marked them up and he knew how to attack a book. You know, he could right. focus in on it and hone in on it and do what he want. And he also had, <coughs> based on some of his writings in his diary, he knew or had familiarity with six languages, including Arabic, because in his last years, he was uh, teaching himself Arabic uh, and reading the Quran because it was a religion of so many people of African descent. Remarkable breath, uh, you know, uh, even though he's a free thinker. He breaks from the church in 1907, another major break, you know, in Harrison's life. So he um, he's just exemplary, I think, in many ways as an independent intellectual. Yeah. Yeah, and he had a lot of influence on many people coming through the Harlem Renaissance yes. and the Negro movement. Uh, one last thing before we get to the Q and A is uh, his his personal life, his marriage. Was it rocky? Was it was it yeah. a, a good marriage? You know uh, that kind of thing. Uh, because when you are politically active, oftentimes the 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 the, the family side gets quote unquote uh, problematic. Yes. Very good question, Sam. He gets married in 1909. His wife comes uh, from the Caribbean up through um, uh, Demerara, I think, Antigua, and comes to New York. And they wind up having five children together, four girls and a, a, a son between 1910 and 1920. And there's not much correspondence in his papers between them. That That may have been because there wasn't much correspondence or because it was pulled out either by the wife after his death or the children or um, or one or two of the children. Um, so there's limited things to go by. And uh, at points, he, he uh, there little notes of affection, but he had a number of affairs. And um, these he documents in his diary. And the, the thing that struck me and impressed me, if you will, about his diary is he writes when he starts it. He goes, 
I'm going to tell it like it is, you know, and I'm going to preserve this. And he was almost writing not only for himself, but for future generations. He goes, some things will loom large, others loom sm smaller. And, and so he documents a number of his affairs starting in the um, teens and going all the way through the 20s, uh, mid 20s at least. Um, most notable amongst them were with Amy uh, Ashwood Garvey, Garvey's first wife, right? Um, yeah. And um, he had one which I still haven't fully convinced myself whether it was just a liter his literary imagination or a flourishing affair with a woman named Elsie. I mentioned it in the book because mm -hmm. there's some torrid correspondence. I didn't go into all of it because. <laughs> No, because Harrison's very literary, also, and I—I I was up to a thousand pages. I said, "I got—I right. got I'll give you a gist of what's going on. Right. Um, but, but what I want to say on that too is, uh, and you—you you were hinting at it yourself, um, Harrison. This is not to apologize for him at all, but he is not unique in this, you know. And and I say that because one reviewer after Volume One came out and says. Uh, oh, well, why couldn't he follow the example of Du Bois and Shirley Graham Du Bois? And I scratched my head and said, they got married at 75. <laughs> Give me a break. You know, Du Bois had, uh, you know, had a life before then, you know, and Booker T and, and Gar, you know, every, everybody. And, and, and not only the black leaders, certainly the white, you know, all these uh, people. So he had these affairs. And what I, what I use, what I quote from, is besides Harrison, I quote from J.A. Rogers, who understood Harrison probably better than most in World's Great Men of, Men of Color. And he has a little passage where he goes, as the saying goes, no man is perfect to his valet, but this does not detract from Hubert Harrison's essential greatness. And I think that's important to keep in mind. And one other thing, in terms of Harlem history and black history, Harrison is a giant. These two volumes are the first multi-volume biography of an Afro-Caribbean and only the fourth of an African-American after those of Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Langston Hughes. And they total, they're in total 1,600 plus pages. So it's there for current and future generations. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes Kevin. Will, you, will, will Jeff be showing um, his slides this session? I, I, I don't know how we're going to do that. I was told the slides they, they, they couldn't take. You, they had to be converted to something else. I, oh, there were a few. Um, yeah, Terry has a few. She has eight. You can just throw them up quickly. They're, they're book covers, I believe, yeah. mostly. Let's see. Yeah. And you can explain what, what we're seeing? Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. If she can throw them up. She's got them. Forgive me for uh, not. Meanwhile, uh, are there any questions, uh, Karen? Uh, you, uh, here, here we go. I just want to mention, well, Sam, let me just go through. There's only eight, so we'll go through these quickly. These are the front covers of the two books. Um, and uh, it's by Columbia University Press. And it includes some uh, positive quotes, there are many positive quotes on both volumes, uh, including from your committee uh, that, that, you know, of, uh, uh, of the group where we were pre presenting before now, Herb Boyd writes some wonderful stuff for both volumes, I think. And, um, but these, uh, there's some quotes that Columbia chose from Brent Hayes Edwards of Columbia, Cornell West and Arnold Rampersad of uh, Stanford University. If that can be blown up a little, you might be able to read it more closely. Can you go to the next slide? Can she, um, can Terry go to the next slide? Yeah, that's the cover of the second volume and that's Harrison teaching his course on world problems of race in 1926 on 135th Street. And the title is The Struggle for Equality, 1918 to 1927. Next slide. That's a book I um, re-edited with Diasporic Africa Press out of Brooklyn. Um, 
and it's Harrison's When Africa Awakes, The Inside Story of the Stirrings and Strivings of the New Negro in the Western World. It was published in 1920, but I added many new notes and um, uh, introductions, right? And what's important about this, amongst other things, when Harrison founds the uh, uh, Liberty League in 1917 and the Voice in 1917, they are the first organization in the first newspaper of the militant new Negro movement. Then in 1919, he edits a newspaper called the New Negro. And then in 1920, he puts out this collection of his writings up until that period, not all of his writings, some of his writings. And uh, what, what he has in, um, in this is 53 articles which were basically essential writings of the militant new Negro movement. All of this is from seven or eight to five years before Alain Locke comes out uh, with his new Negro in 1925. Much of the previous history about the uh, history writing about the new Negro has been about Alain Locke and the new Negro, but Locke's new Negro is essentially a literary effort and movement. Right. Harrison's was both political and literary because he's uh, he's a leading political activist, but he's also the leading publisher, editor, and writer in that period. One other thing about this picture, you'll see a tricolor flag there, black, brown, and yellow. That was the tricolor flag of Harrison's Liberty League. And yeah. uh, he, he mentions that in this book again. Uh, what, what's of note is that Garvey, who drew much of his organizational ideas and aims from Harrison, when he founds his um, uh, UNIA and uh, starts developing his organization, he uses a tricolor of red, black, and green, which is what people are familiar with today. But Harrison says uh, he chose black, brown, and yellow because that's the colors we are domestically and internationally. I thought it was a pretty profound, and this would preceded Garvey. I thought that was a pretty profound uh, statement and uh, you know, concept. Do we have any questions? Is the topic of turning down money addressed in the book? Yes, particularly, <laughs> particularly in both volumes, particularly in the second volume. And I talk about um, where some of that funding was coming from, what, what we started touching on earlier, Sam. And I think it's very important for today, you know, for people to think about. And uh, again, Harrison may, may not always be right, but, you know, he's pretty straightforward in what he's thinking. And uh, we can judge and weigh it for what it's worth. And uh, his, his approach was different than those of uh, Randolph and Owen, than those of Du Bois, than those of Garvey. And those are Briggs, you know. Mm -hmm. We have another question, or uh, yes, another one. Um, are there any records of recognition of him in St. Croix? Very good question. Uh, oh, and this leads into a, an issue with in Harlem too. First, before I get to St. Croix, in 2013, I went with others, including Harrison's granddaughter Ilva, who lives in Harlem, uh, to. Uh, the Parks and Recreation meeting of Community Board 10 of Harlem. And uh, we had been going for a number of meetings and they unanimously passed a motion to name 134th Street and Lenox Avenue, uh, that stretch, Hubert Harrison Way, I believe it was. Uh, unanimously passed, but it never got implemented. Uh, you know, and it may be something people wanna follow up on at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And because 134th and Lennox is where um, Harrison oftentimes would deliver his uh, talks in Harlem. He pioneered street speaking in Harlem, which was later Randolph, Owen, Mar uh, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X. You know, he starts that tradition kind of others, too. But, and so uh, that that's something uh, in, in terms of Harlem. But then in terms of St. Croix, and I'm going to be speaking again. I, I've been to St. Croix quite a number of times, and I'm in touch with Dr. Ch Chenzira 
Kahana Davis, who's at the university there and is very active in trying to promote Harrison, as well as a fellow named George Tynes, who um, put together the St. Croix African Roots Project, you know, which traced family trees and lineage. And um, there's some effort underway and a fellow named Russell Christopher, who's uh, here in the States and is trying to encourage people to do things. But there's some efforts to, you know, memorialize in some way uh, Hubert Harrison down there. there were, and one of the good things I like about my next session, which is, as I said, in about a week, is Dr. Ch uh, Chen is going to have me speak before her group of students, the younger generation, uh, in, in a Q&A for about half an hour, 45 minutes. And hopefully some, some of the younger generation will get inspired and take the lead on this because they're oftentimes capable of getting a lot done. Um, before we get to the last question, uh, I have a question for Karen. 134th and Malcolm, is there going to be a plaque there where we live? We'll put a plaque. Uh, nope, nope. But we we can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Right now, Absolutely. the city is looking at you know. I'll just tell the people who are watching. Uh, while we are still here, has a Harlem Heritage Markers project, and we got funded to do 25 signs over two years throughout various parts of Harlem to um, honor individuals, organizations, and events. And Hubert Harrison really needs to be one of these people, absolutely. Um, if I may, on my uh, on my webpage, which I, we put up earlier, I don't know if we put it up, but it's www.jeffreybperry.net. Right on the front page, you'll see a photo from when we were getting signatures to have the street named uh, for mm. Hubert Harrison. And Harrison's daughter is there with me and Dr. Ben. Dr. Ben was a big supporter of it. And Dr. Ben really appreciated Harrison, you know, as to John Henry Clark and a number of, you know, very important people in Harlem history. Before we take our, our last question, Sam, I wanted to tell people that any kind of contribution would be welcomed by while we are still here. Um, our website where you can donate is wwsh.nyc. It's an unusual uh, name. It's wwsh.nyc. And I thank you all. Well, we have one last question from uh, Chomtoli Ch Hawk. Does Harrison's activism provide any insights on how to navigate these challenging these these challenges for political power or any insight for the present context? Very good question. And I think the answer is definitely yes. Many insights, but I'll just point to a few things that struck me early. And Harrison wrote this as early as 1911 and 1912. He wrote that the Negro is using the language of the day. The Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. I had to look up touchstone because I wasn't sure what it meant, but it's a black stone and you rub the metal against it to see if it's really the gold it's purported to be. Any issue you look at in society, let's put it to the test. Housing, education, healthcare, how are black people faring and what are we gonna do about it? That, that's one thing. Second, Harrison, understood that the centrality of struggle against white supremacy was the key to social change in this country. And I think that's a message that we have to make clear and spread widely. He articulated it with the socialists, he articulated it later. It's not like some of the organizations today who when they list their, make their list of demands of what they stand for, they go, and number seven is, racial equality or something like that. It's key. It's right up there. Number one, it, because, because white supremacy is central to how the ruling class maintains control in this country, but how they can also be defeated if we can defeat them on that issue. So amongst other things, but I, I think you'll find many other things that Harrison points out of interest too. He's got a lot to offer current generations and future generations. I thank you, um, Jeff Perry, for uh, your work over the over the decades. Um, these two important volumes on Hubert Harrison 
um, should be part of every uh, major library and schools and uh, and, and people in, in people's homes. It's very, very important, the uh, work that you've done. There's one more question. Terry said there's one more question. Oh, oh Charles Brooks says, uh, what can we take away from Harrison and apply to the current states of politics, the analysis of white supremacy, race, and class? Well, and that's a little... answered that in part. Yeah, I, I just answered that, but um, Harrison was um, very principled and he was not going to back off um, the question of the fight against white supremacy where others might be willing to yield on it. He thought had a had a hold strong. And when um, some of the left groups um, didn't do that, he was not going to wait around for them. He was going to take action. And he did that. Um, uh, Early when he left the Socialist Party and he finds the New Negro Movement, uh, you know, he, he says we can't wait because their, their help might not come when we need it, you know. And until that time, he goes, we, we they should help us. They should be involved. But if they're not, we will proceed, you know, on, on our own and pushing and always central was this question of democracy, democracy partly, but equality and and the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy. But he, he was he was a great internationalist also. So he he writes about the importance of relations with peoples of color in particular worldwide, but others in struggle worldwide. So he's got a tremendous breadth. Um, some of his talks you'll see in volume two, World Problems of Race, a whole series he does up there on 135th Street. Um, history, uh, African history, the chapters are amazing. They're fascinating even to this day. Um, I, I just would encourage people to take a look at the book and poke around, uh, both books, and poke around because it, there's so very much that Harrison has to offer. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Karen? Thank you very much, Sam. And thank you very much, Jeffrey, for a very, very educational hour. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, thank you, Karen. And thank you, Terry, and everyone else involved in this effort. I really appreciate I appreciate you helping to bring Hubert Harrison to the audience. And the point, Sam, that you made about if we can help get Harrison into the public libraries and the college and university libraries, very important because the people can get this, can get to learn about it.